attitude of the of Eurasec or Pascal of Alliance Francaise for uh, co organizing this uh, event. And thank you uh, very much to Kul Prawit for accepting to moderate this debate. So I will let uh, Kul Prawit uh, ask an uh, incisive question. <laughs> Evening. Um, thank you very much for having me um, here um, at the Alliance France this evening, and I'm very honored um, to be here to um, give my takes on the book and as well as sort of lubricate your, your talk about um, Buddhism and politics in Thailand. Um, let me just start by saying that I was impressed by the wide scope of the book. You know, this is less than a hundred pages. Um, and, and yet we managed to really cover a, a very wide range of, of topics in relation to Thai Buddhism and politics. Not just central Thailand, we went, you know, something on the deep south and the conflicts between the um, Thai Malay Muslims and, and the state-sanctioned Buddhism and all that. But let, let me just start by um, quoting a few passages from, from this book for those who may have not read the, 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 the book and I encourage you to uh, go and grab a copy, probably t towards the end or after the end of this um, evening. I start with page 60, um, and I believe that's your own observations on the um, Dhammagaya temple, or Prat Dhammagaya temple. As everyone knows, the temple has been embroiled in many um, 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 charges related to, to its um, um, business and, and other misconduct and the military regime had tried to crack down on it, surrounded it um, for many months, uh, for many weeks and and uh, yet has failed to really um, um, uproot the temple. Um, and Kunan uh, stated that, um, in a way, and I quote, what Prat Dhammagaya has done, what, 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 what Prat Dhammagaya has done for religion was what Tassin has done for politics. Adopted a dynamics approach to modern and out-of-date institution and adapted it to the 21st century's expectations. Um, maybe he, you might be able to later talk more about that, but I still want to quote a few, a few things before I really get on to letting you speak. Um, on page 67, there's this interview with um, um, interview with um, another controversial monk, um, Prat Buddha Isra. Many who are follower of Thai politics may have heard that um, Buddha Isra or Prat Buddha Isra has been playing a very prominent role as a monk in uh, leading a protest against Ying Lak Shinawatra uh, in the months um, prior to the coup in May 2014. And I was surprised. Uh, because this is the other side of uh, Buddha Isra. Normally, you would think of him as a hardcore, you know, monk who would most probably have a very conservative views towards um, Buddhism and its role in the state. So, Kun Anua ask uh, Buddha Isra on page sixty-seven, what is your position on Buddhism as the national religion? And I will quote part of. Um, Prat Buddha Isra's answer, I open quotation, I don't agree with it. No country is establishing a religion as a national religion except for Islamic countries. And do you want us to believe to be like Islamic countries? And the Buddha never asked that Buddhism be made a national religion. And despite this, Buddhism has survived for more than 2,000 years. So that's sort of, you know, the side of Buddha's Isra that I, I don't even recall having read that in, in any Thai um, journal. Um, now, two more. On page 71, and who was this this time? Um, it's another um, interview this time with a, um, a wise rector of Mahajula Logan um, Buddhist University, which is the premier. Um, um, 
Buddhist University for Thai monks and the venerable quoted here or interviewed here by Gunan Wok um, is um, Pragmati Dhammachan. Okay, and um, it was a question about um, political activism of Buddha Isra, you know, whether it is against the um, Buddhist uh, Vinaya or regulations or not. And he said, and I quote, Monks have to follow both the country's laws and monastic discipline. To incite troubles and conflict is not what monks should do. On the contrary, they should be the water that extinguishes the fire. So you see the balance, you know, that that, that Gunana went quite um, uh, uh, far to try to um, um, put different uh, views toward this whole debate about um, Thai Buddhism and the role of the state and, 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 and society. Now, let me just finish quoting um, the book uh, by turning to page 75. Um, this is actually a much, at least talked about uh, issues, even by the Thai language media. The fact that there are some so-called military monks in the Deep South, and I mean in Patani, um, Naratiwat, and Yala provinces. You, you wonder what, who, who are, or what are the military monks, and here Gunario refer to them as soldiers who are ordained and keep their weapons while officiating as monks reinforces these conflations between the Buddhist religion and nationalistic politics in the eyes of the Thai Malay Muslims. I, this is a very interesting book in the sense that it, the scope is really wide range. I, I wish it would go deeper, but I don't think you could do that with you know a, a 99 um, pages book. So this is a, a really excellent primer on Buddhism as it is, as opposed to, as the ambassador have said, you know, what we read about the Buddhist philosophy, or actually there are more, more have been written about Thai Buddhism in terms of their people's superstitious belief, you know, amulets and everything. Well, this is, I think, a rather um, very valuable primer for both, you know, Thai and non-Thai readers and for this, I'm very grateful. Now, let me just start by asking you, um, um, you know, you, you told me you spent two years, right, um, finishing the book. Um, what, what, if you could tell us a bit about what might, might be the most surprising aspect of this uh, endeavor, you know, this whole task of writing uh, a book about, uh, you know, Thai Buddhism and politics are topics not often touched by anyone interested in Buddhism in, in Thailand. Because anyone interested in Buddhism in Thailand are mostly very concerned about either you know, the so-called Buddhist philosophy, meditations, or if not, into the superstitious side of, of Buddhism. Now you have a, 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 a more, um, um, a heavier side of Buddhism, the role of the states from Rama the fifth, if not even earlier, and how, from your point of view, it has failed to um, adapt and cope with a new reality. Well, the, the, thank you, Kunpali. The departure point of the book was really, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to write a book, and I asked myself uh, what I am the most interested in, and two things emerge, Thai politics and Buddhism. So the sort of obvious answer uh, was to write a book on Buddhism and politics in Thailand. So I started uh, about three years ago to work on this. I read a lot of books and I realized that there were quite many books written on the topics, um, really about the whole, the whole period since the Buddha time. Some people have uh, studied uh, uh, Buddhism and politics during the time of Asoka. Uh, there has been m many books during the Ayutthaya period also books um, during the 19th century um, in, in uh, Siam when uh, uh, King Rama V sort of uh, uh, centralized uh, civilian power and there was also a centralization of uh, the monastic community and also books on uh, the 50s, the 60s and the 70s. But what I found out is that there were not um, 
almost any books written since the beginning of the 21st century on very few academic articles. So I thought uh, uh, this would be interested to really uh, focalize on uh, what has happened since what I would call the transition crisis. What I call the transition crisis is uh, what started in 2005 uh, with uh, this kind of polarization that we see in the Thai society between what we can say are the pro-taxin and, and the anti-taxin, but it's much deeper than that. What I call the transition crisis is um, the fact that th there is the end of a long and prestigious reign. Um, uh, we are facing the uncertainty of the future. This is on one side. So this is a delicate thing for, for Thailand. But also, the kind of administrative framework that is existing currently in Thailand is a framework which has been uh, built at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So it, it's a kind of very archaic framework. And it has not been uh, uh, modernized. It, it has not been really reformed, even if there were a, a few changes, of course. And I was interested in uh, what kind of role can Buddhism play in this transition phase, because we know that the, the nationalism, the, the trilogy of the Thai identity, uh, religion, nation, and king, uh, so there is religion in it, but if the monarchy is sort of less influential in the, in the future, what will make uh, the unity between the Thai people, what will be the unifying factor between all these people who, who are very different according to the social class to which they, they belong? What is common uh, between uh, um, a high-flying Thai businessman in Bangkok and, uh, and a farmer from the North Sea? They are very far away in the style of living from each other. But the, the king was the one who was giving a sense of unity to all these people, but now the king is gone. So can Buddhism also play a, a central role in this? And after, uh, so the question of Kunprawit covered a lot of grounds, and I will come back to this. But after having uh, studied, done interviewed, uh, crisscrossed Thailand, read many books, my, my uh, result was that, uh, the result of my investigation was that no, Buddhism cannot really play uh, a big role in giving a sense of unity to the country because Buddhism itself is in a deep crisis. And if uh, the civilian administration is, uh, is archaic, has not really modernized, actually the way the monastic community is built is even more archaic. It was copied on the civilian administration at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th, 20th century, but it was never really modernized, uh, even less than the civilian administration. So the, the monks who are at the top of the ladder, they have no interest to reform the monastic community, the, the Buddhist hierarchical structure, because they are where they are because of the way the system is working. So the reformer monks, um, there are some, of course, but they are at the periphery of the monastic community. And they can reform a temple, they can uh, set a Buddhist group on trying to, to uh, have a, a different approach, but they are not uh, at the core of the system, they are not within the system. So their influence is not, is not very big. So coming back to the question of Kun Tawit, uh, Buddhism and politics in Thailand is, is, is a very complex uh, uh, question. And if we, if we think about what Pratamakai, um, there are good and bad things with what, what Pratamakai is doing. And for instance, the passage that uh, Kun Prawit is, is quoting, uh, yes, I think Pratamakai is one of the very few temples who try to adapt Buddhism to modernity, who try to make Buddhism relevant to what Thailand is in the 21st century. There are some aspects that I personally dislike of, with Watamaka, which is uh, the use of marketing techniques, uh, a kind of uh, very materialistic approach of Buddhism, 
But we have to recognize that at least they are trying to do something. They are dynamic, uh, they are professional in what they do, they are very good in public relations, so we should not be uh, only negative. And I think the Thai press, in a way, has, has a kind of quite negative um, uh, approach of what Namakai most of the time. Um, so they don't, they don't emphasize uh, the, the other side. Um, so on, on the other uh, aspect also, uh, Praputa Isara. So Praputa Isara is this, this uh, village monk in uh, Nakhon Patong province who is extremely uh, kind of violent in the way he expresses himself, which is rather typical of the village monk. He, he reminds me of Long Tamahabua in a way, but it, it's also part of the style of the village monk. They, they are people who are extremely straightforward, they are not polite, they use crude words, but the, the, the Thai people in the province are used to that. But it's true that when I asked him about Buddhism as a national religion, his, his position was extremely open, much more open than, than the position of, uh, of other monks who, who may appear more progressive, but who say, uh, yes, we must have uh, Buddhism as a national religion because we are threatened by Muslims. Uh, so we, we have to uh, root, uh, we have to create a close association between nation and, and religion, and we have to write it in the constitution, that's very important. So just a few words to uh, launch a debate on, I'm um, waiting question on Kul Prawiton from the audience, of course. Thank you. Maybe I will just uh, run a short list before we um, you know, open the floor. It was interesting, and actually you noted in your book that um, Wat Damagaya, or Damagaya Temple actually support the nationalization of you know, Buddhism, or making Buddhism the state, the, the national religion, as opposed to Buddha Isra, who, as you mentioned, seems to be violent or crude and all that, and, and yet his stance was that uh, he doesn't think um, Buddhism should be made a national religion. And, on, 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 and at the same time, while I, I feel that you painted a rather dark um, um, prospect for the future of you know, the, the Thai Buddhism with a big B, that is, um, I, I, I tend to think that it's also an opportunity. The fact that um, temples like Dhammagaya has become so popular I think partly, it partly has to do with the fact that many of these followers of the Dhammagaya temple have been totally disillusioned by the traditional um, state um, sanctioned um, um, Buddhist um, order. And Dhammagaya is just one, you know, as a Thai and technically a Buddhist and a uh, say my protege of Jan Sulak, whom you cited in the book, in Sulak Sivarasa, I always think that most Thais these days, or many Thais these days, are just Buddhists by name. Okay, they know very, they're not very serious about the Buddhist, the core Buddhist teaching. And they'll be more, uh, either into rituals, and there are many Buddhist rituals, you know, you can count the, the calendar, uh, the Thai Buddhist calendar. If not, they are totally disillusioned. And, and really uninvolved, you know, or unengaged with, with Buddhism as, as you uh, have written about. And in this sense, um, if I may ask and provoke, is it not even better, I mean, from my point of view, that, you know, the state-sanctioned Buddhism is becoming irrelevant? Because probably, you know, any decentralization uh, of power, including the religious um, um, power, a non-hegemonic power might be better. You know, most Thais don't relate to the Supreme Patriarch or whatever, you know, it's, it's, I think in Bangkok, they will be in the minority. And if there are other Thais who are really into Buddhism, they would be into, say, you know, uh, the sort of Buddhism that um, meditation teachers like Vichak Panit, whom you cited in, Ajahn Vichak Panit, whom you cited in the book, would be into, you know, in a very technical or philosophical way. So it's sort of, people sort of bypassed the irrelevance of 
you know, state-sanctioned Buddhism. I don't know if we need to revive them and, and, and expect them to, to be um, um, something that would play a special role, okay? If it can no longer play a special role, maybe uh, well and good, we, we will, you know, have you know, more Buddhism with a small B than the big B, that is. Um, yeah, so maybe with that, I, either if you want to react or we could just uh, start um, um, getting some... Maybe I will uh, re react a little bit. Yes, I'm, I'm rather pessimistic. Uh, it's interesting, I was reading about the Ayutthaya times, and uh, during Ayutthaya times, uh, um, there was not all this system, uh, top-down system in the monastic community. And for instance, uh, the abbot of the temple, they were chosen by the local monks, and Buddhism was extremely localized. Um, and, and the people were uh, had strong links with the local monks, and there, there was no, no uh, uh, one supreme patriarch. Actually, there were four during uh, uh, Ayutthaya times. All this was changed in the 19th century when there was uh, first the creation of the, the Tamayut uh, order by uh, uh, Prince Monkut, who became King Rama IV, and then uh, uh, the son of King Monkut, and uh, our brother of uh, King Rama V, uh, Vachirayan Varurot, uh, sort of uh, uh, solidified, consolidated uh, Tamayut as, as a, a royally sponsored order. And then with King Rama V, there was this organization of the Sangha, which was uh, uh, closely copied on the civilian administration with a supreme patriarch, which is a kind of prime minister, and then as a provincial district, sub-district level, uh, ecclesiastical officials for, for the Buddhist search. And the reason why I'm, I'm pessimistic is that I think that this very close link between the monastic community on the state is uh, detrimental to, to Buddhism because uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, Buddhism and the monastic community has become a tool in the end of the state. So uh, it, it was a case uh, during the monarchy after uh, the 19th century, but it was also the, the case after the revolution of 1932. So the power, either monarchical power or uh, elected politician would use Buddhism as a way to legitimate their power by participating to Buddhist ceremony. And then on, on the other side, the Buddhist community, the monastic community, is financially supported by, by the state. In Thailand there are 300,000 monks, 40,000 40, of them get a monthly salary from, from the state. It's not a very, very big salary, I think, but they still do get a, a monthly salary. And then uh, there are uh, over 100 million euros of uh, money given by the state to the temple uh, to build, to, to renovate building, to promote uh, religious activities. So I think the, the problem is this link as is sort of killing from inside the, uh, Buddhism and, and it has a, created a distance between the monastic hierarchy and the local, the, the, the local people, the local communities, which was very different in the past. But I don't want to give the, I, I don't want to give the impression that, uh, uh, I don't want to make a caricatural uh, description. Actually, Buddhism is also quite alive at the local level uh, when we see monks like Luang Pokun, uh, who are not at all in the uh, Buddhist hierarchy. Uh, these monks are venerated by the local people. Uh, even a monk like Luang Tamahabua, uh, who was uh, from the north northeast of Thailand, was venerated by the people. So it's it's kind of two way. But uh, I remember that I read one time about the reason why Buddhism disappeared from India. Uh, I think it disappeared around the fifth or the sixth century from India, and one of the a response which was given by the scholar is because religion had become only the religion of the elite and not more the religion of the people. The religion of the people at that time was Hinduism and that's why uh, I'm not sure if it's really true, I'm not an expert on this, but, but some scholars say that's why Buddhism uh, died uh, in, in India.
Well, just before, I, I just like to add that I, I don't think I'm very worried about that, you know, the Thai monks in the provinces who, you know, are more popular amongst the locals who have no um, um, titles. They're very, you know, they, they're very good at making amulets, okay, Buddhist amulets. That's hugely popular. Or giving, say, the lucky lotto number, the lottery number for the next round of lottery. So at a local level, there are still that sort of monks. And of course, and on the other hand, you get the so-called re reformist monks like Prat Pai San, Visalo. Okay, they have this what I have international network of um, engaged Buddhist. Uh, they are reaching out to be more ecumenical, you know, and you get this whole new wave of. You know, um, upper middle class Thais, well educated, have been educated abroad, and they're just very focused on, say, you know, meditation or Buddhism as a philosophy. You know, if, from my point of view, the state sanctioned Buddhism would die, that actually might be, you know, it's like decay of Catholicism in parts of Europe, in, in Germany, for example. <laughs> You know, might it not be good, but uh, of course I rest my case. Uh, and your book has been very thought provoking because it, uh, you covered a, a wide ground, had interviewed uh, numerous interesting people from from different um, perspective on these issues. So maybe I would uh, then throw the open the floor to 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 anyone who might want to. Um, comment, ask questions, or disagree with the writer, please. Oh, Claire, you might want to go first, please. Yes, I, ha I have just a question. Uh, you, you talk about uh, the question of the elite, and uh, well, I'm working on, on religion, on Catholicism and Christianism, but uh, we are working with colleagues from uh, Southeast Asia uh, uh, on, on religious mobility. And we are, when we are working on religion, we have always this uh, methodological problem, which is to study religion from the bottom, on fr uh, from the bottom or from the top. And uh, the top uh, wanted always to to organize everything and uh, to centralize, whereas the, the bottom is very diverse. When we talk about Buddhism, there is not one Buddhism. We have a great diversity, religious diversity, and also political diversity within one religion. And so uh, the tendency uh, for the politicians or for the religious leaders is to, to unify it, the concept. But when we are working with uh, anthropologists, I'm an historian, but with, uh, when I'm working with my, uh, anthropology, uh, uh, my colleague who are anthropologists, we can see that on the, on the, on the bottom we have so great uh, diversity of practice. For example, uh, um, my colleague, uh, she's working on, on Buddhism in Burma, in Arakan. And she say that on the on the uh, on the field, you have Muslim and Buddhists who are uh, 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 practicing the same cult. And so, so uh, what is I, I wanted to to ask you when you was work uh, was it, you was uh, studying this topic and was on the field, uh, how to deal with this tension from uh, the elite and the the, the bottom the the top and the, the bottom how to to take in uh, account. Uh, all this great diversity uh, in, uh, on, in the country, in, in Thailand. Well, I, I went to see uh, both level and discuss with, with them. Uh, um, uh, so I, I didn't really have a, a methodology, but, but, but I, I went to, to quite a few provinces, uh, met local monks, but I also tried to, to meet uh, monks from the, from the hierarchy, like uh, more from uh, Maha Makut uh, University. And then I am, fundamentally I'm, I'm a journalist. Uh, I'm a journalist with an interest in, in some specialized field. Uh, but the way I'm, I'm working, uh, I'm starting from, from what I see. Uh, I'm not starting from a con concept. I don't have a, at the beginning I don't have a conceptual approach. So, so I'm just meeting people, interviewing people. And, and then when I gather the, um, the, the, the matter when I gather all the elements, I'm trying to see if I can get a, a kind of uh, uh, more general tendency. But I'm very careful not to uh, not to start from a conceptual approach. So 
So. My name is Nicole Dupal, I'm the Executive Director of Global Health Asia Institute. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I haven't read the book, so I wonder if you have, um, in this book you discuss the concept of sufficiency thinking, uh, how is it, or if you, if you discuss it at all or not. I'm just curious because I think it's kind of what su sufficiency thinking and sufficiency economy, because it comes also from the Buddhism and impacts politics. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I don't discuss it. No. So I'm a graduate student from UW Medicine. My dissertation is on Buddhism and politics in Thailand as well. So thank you for this. It's going to help. <laughs> and because I have interviewed more or less the same people that you did, and just I'm really curious, what do you think to be the reason, to be the impetus behind the crackdown of the Makaya? Because as you mentioned in the book, and we can see that after the 2006 coup, the, the Hunter government has been taking a hard line against the monastic community, especially the monastic establishment. And if we follow the line of reasoning that Kun Pramit laid out, that the monastic establishment is becoming irrelevant, why the crackdown? If it's relevant, what part of it? What about it that is relevant? And by the way, just to clarify, Prabhupada Isla, if you really look at the way that he speaks, his statement is very, very much in line with the security apparatus of Thailand. Because if you see the palace, and we are, we are, not, we are not talking about the, all these different IOs that government or does, or what, what security apparatus in the deep south does, okay? If you look at it, they don't like the idea of national religion. And that's with that very, very clearly expressed. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for this point, it, it, it's very relevant. Why is a um, military regime is uh, cracking down on, on what, what Pratamakai and maybe some other groups? I, I, think, it's, it's, um, I think it's striking that, that uh, the, the military want to control everything. They are obsessed by control. They control street food, they control graffiti. They need to control everything. That's military mind. But, but um, uh, so in this context, uh, what Pratamakai is a huge organization. It's, uh, they, they, are, they have influence on hundreds of temples. Um, they have infiltrated the university. Um, they are quite influential in, in, uh, among the urban population and, and they're very successful, they're quite successful. So for, for a military government, this is a, a movement which is structured, organized, professional across the country. So it's, it's sort of quite threatening for them. They, they, they need to control it, they need to do something. Uh, they don't feel comfortable with with this group in Patum Thani that they can't control. So that's, that's my interpretation that they need to... Um, uh, then, um, um, yeah, may, maybe there are some aspect of the way uh, what Pratamakai teach Buddhism which are uh, irritating from, for some uh, people who have relations to the, with the Genta. So we know that uh, um, they have a very materialistic approach, for instance, they, they would say that Nipan Pen Atta, so uh, they, they consider that there is a self, and that in a, in a way Nirvana, Nipana is, is, is a kind of a super self. So this can be irritating, but I, I, for, for some uh, uh, Buddhist monks and Buddhist scholars, but I, I don't think uh, it's the main reason for the military government. The thing which is quite surprising, or maybe you have the answer, 
that I don't have is that there was this crackdown last time in February 2017 when they sent the 4,000 policemen and it was a fiasco. And, and uh, uh, since then it's complete silence uh, in the media. It's, uh, I, my last time in Web Prada Macai was in March 2017, just after the crackdown. Uh, so I, I don't know what the situation is there now, but, but I, I find it interesting that it's, it's complete silence. We, we don't know where Pratamachayo is, uh, we, we don't know what's happening within Watamakai, and nobody is speaking about it, and the military seems not interested by it anymore. So I'm just wondering uh, uh, what has been the evolution, but maybe you have the answer. <laughs> yeah. May I make a comment? Because it's not just one Makaya that is the target. I mean, there are several targets, right? Because right after the military came to power, about about three to four months, they set up the first reform committee for Buddhism, which people didn't mention, people didn't re re recall that anymore. And they asked the former police chief, Adun Saksinkao, to head the committee. That went, that went south, nothing happened. Four months, about four to six months later, that's when Kun Pai Bun personally suggested that he would like to take on this endeavor. And he did, and it became this big thing. Because first, I mean, at first, monastic community was complaining about its lack of representation within that committee. But after the second meeting of the committee, in which this agenda of somehow trying to discipline the Makaya came up, out of nowhere. That's when it really gained a lot of traction. So it's, that's why I'm really curious why the monastic community, why now? It's not, the Makaya is a combination of many ones. But um, if we speak about the financial aspect, and I think uh, Kun Pai Bun was, was very focused on, on this uh, kind of uh, um, proposition of law or, or draft law that uh, he wrote, there, there are laws which are uh, trying to, to force, uh, to impose all the temples to, to have a systematic audit, financial audit every year, and to have more transparency on, on the money side, on the use of donation, on the use of the money coming from the government. So, uh, I would say this is, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if it's a crackdown because we can see that when uh, there is a monk with a Louis Vuitton bag flying in his, uh, in a, in his private jet to, to America, there seems to be a real problem with, with the financial transparency of the monastic community. Or even when uh, uh, I went to St. Temple, I see what well, is uh, moving around in Mercedes Benz, and you know, you, you think, well, you know, the, so Buddhism is supposed to be about, uh, uh, you know, you you not attached to material things. So maybe this is a little bit naive, but but I think there, there is a real issue about the financial side, and I think uh, Pai Bun is really focused on this. But then there are other elements, uh, more political elements. I, I agree with this. Yes, uh, I think that the Thai society is quite deeply so divided over Dhammagaya, partly because uh, a lot of uh, people, especially uh, those uh, well-educated people, they are uh, not happy with the way the Dhammagaya the Dhammagaya interpret the uh, Buddhist doctrine. They, they, but the funny thing is, so far we don't know what is the authentic version of Buddhist teaching. Because uh, 2,500 years already since the Buddha passed away. Yeah, it's so funny because they just, you know, attack each other over what is the authentic version of Buddhist teaching. We have to bear in mind that most of the Buddhist teaching in Thailand, we, you know, got from Sri Lanka, right? Uh, Tripitaka. But the thing is, the Tripitaka just or wrote it the scripture after the Lord Buddha passed away more than a thousand years. You see, so 
the authenticity of the Buddhist teaching is a big question. Yeah. But I totally agree with Kun Abrowit. He, he said that uh, the most popular uh, Buddhist monks in, in Thailand are the forest Buddhist monk. We actually we say in Thai, Prat Wat Pa, right? Because they are just practicing uh, the meditation. That's, that is the proper way <coughs> to achieve the ultimate level of wisdom, right? And so it, it, it's quite hard for me to dissociate Buddhism with uh, special power. So it's actually the extra wisdom we call it in the Pali of Abhinya. That is extra wisdom. Now this is the reason why Buddhism is so popular in the state. Because um, most American people are so clever. They don't know how to interpret Buddhism you know, in the way that's really enlightening. Because uh, if you ask the student, you they ask them question, what is the Buddhist teachings is all about? They would say, oh, about uh, this doctrine. that. You know. But actually, they don't know the real meaning of the Buddhist teachings. Yeah. That's why, you know, a lot of Buddhist monks in the deep forest, they are so popular. Whatever amulets they create, so popular. And even I myself, I, I cannot believe my eyes. When I went down in the countryside, and I saw these kind of things, and I, I think this is a good sign. Why? Because this is a proper way toward the <coughs> Nibbana. The meditation is, can be equated with Nibbana. That is the best thing. And the highest wisdom. It's not just like a virtue, doing merit, giving, giving arm, helping people, but it's the ultimate virtue that human beings can create. Thank you. Yes, the, the doctrine has been sort of fixed, I think, about three centuries after the death of Buddha by the Tripitaka. There has been interpretation. So in Sri Lanka, uh, Buddha Gosa, there were interpretation of of Buddhism, but um, if we look at the history of Buddhism in Thailand, what is sort of interesting is that the, the conflict within the uh, monastic community, they're not really about doctrine most of the time, they are about formal, formal thing. And I remember François Bizot wrote a book uh, about 20 years ago, and uh, his book is, is about uh, a conflict between uh, uh, two different uh, movement, monastic movements in Thailand. One who wants to put the, the, the robe on the right side, and the other one who wants to put the robe on the left side. And that was really a very intense conflict, and nothing to see with doctrine. But yes, yeah, there are some, uh, uh, somebody like Prayu, Prayu, Prayu Payuto would speak about doctrine, and he criticized Tamakai about the doctrine. But um, the form is also, as we know, form is very important in, in Thailand. So, uh, the way you dress, uh, the way you, you, you speak the sermon, the, the kind of language you use, all this is also, is also very, very important. Oh, the micro is for him. Bien, bien. I would like to ask a question which is related to the Okay, I would like to ask you a question which is related to the Southern Thailand conflict in Pataniyala. Uh, and Narati what? Uh, how do you explain, even though what you both said may partly explain what is not the case, the question is why it hasn't uh, provoked a kind of a backlash or a sort of radicalization of certain uh, parts of Thai or certain quarters in Buddhism? Uh, well, um, if we take the, if we compare with what's happening now in Burma, and I'm aware that the relation between Buddhism 
and state in Burma is quite different from religion between the, the, the relation between Buddhism and the state in Thailand. But uh, nevertheless, what we see what have what's been happening with uh, the monk uh, Viratu, who is an extremist and calling the Burmese Buddhist people to sort of fight or expel the, 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 the Muslim Islam being considered as a threat to uh, Buddhism in Burma. Why do you think some monks or some people within the Buddhism Sangha in Thailand have not so been influenced by this kind of ideology and how what has happened in Burma has not happened to a certain extent in Thailand considering that you've been having this conflict at least since 2005 and then, it, I mean, when we know we, we've been dra dragging down, uh, dragging on uh, since uh, the, the 40s or 50s. So how would you um, explain uh, that the different situation between Burma and Thailand on that matter? I, I think there are several elements. Uh, uh, one, one is the, the history. Uh, uh, Patani, all this region, uh, was not integrated in, in Thailand uh, uh, before uh, 1909. Um, uh, so it was under the, I mean, it was a tributary from Ayutthaya before and, and so on, but it, it, was, it was a Malay kingdom. Uh, so uh, it's not like, it's not really like Arak Arakan, I think the, the story is different. Because even if the Rohingya are there for, for several generations, uh, I mean, they have not been there for 1,000 years, uh, as are the Malay in Patani. Then I think th there is, uh, of course, because uh, the Buddhist monk in Myanmar participated to the struggle for independence, they sort of very, really more politicized, and, and they politicized in a way that uh, they're not uh, politicized only in a dependent relation with the state. They, they, we, we could see in 2007, I was in Rangoon in 2007, and, and suddenly we saw these monks emerging uh, under the military dictatorship on, on making a demonstration. This, this cannot happen in, in, in Thailand. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's the, the main element. And then a third element I think is, I personally feel, but I could be wrong, that there is a, a deep xenophobic element in Burma that you don't have in Thailand. I think fundamentally Thai are tolerant. Uh, are tolerant people, they are, uh, they are very open, they, they're welcoming. Uh, they can be tension, but they, they, they don't have these things. That when I meet uh, monks in Myanmar, they, they look down on me, they, they sort of the superstars, they're very um, contemptuous. Uh, they are aware of this very high status. I never had this feeling with monks in Thailand, even important monks. Uh, they, they're very friendly, very open, so happy that a foreigner is interested by Buddhism. So I think there is a, a kind of cultural element uh, also also in it, so that, yes, the element of, of answer I, I, would, I would give. If I may add, um, you know, as a Buddhist, and I, I'm, I'm a Bangkokian, I, I always say is when we talk about the, the three southernmost provinces or, you know, the former sultanate of, of Patani, I always say, you know, this was never a marriage, okay? If anything, it was rape. And look, unless you are, you know, a Muslim, you can divorce if you're not happy with your marriage. And we... We, and I speak we as the Thai Buddhists, mostly from Bangkok and central Thailand, have failed to enable the Thai Malay Muslims to feel as if they are our equal. So what do we do? You know, I said, you know, I'm, I'm one of those few Thai Buddhists who would, who, who would say, you know, if they want a referendum one day, let it be. Because people there, if you go to the deep south, they couldn't. I think they could relate themselves more to northern Malaysia than, than, than the rest of Thailand. And of course, as Kunanua have said, um, it's their homeland, okay? You know, most Thai Buddhists who are pretty ignorant about history would say, oh, if you're not happy, if you want to do this and that, just go back, you know, just leave Thailand. They have probably never read the history of Patani. Secondly, I think there's this 
a long tradition of integration and, and coexistence between Buddhists and people of other religions, including Muslims. And we're not just talking about the, the, the Malay Muslims in the Deep South. You know, you've got uh, Indian Muslims from South Asia, even from Persia, the Bunak family. In Bangkok, they're just everywhere. Okay, and I, I don't really... You know, the whole... Actually, we are concerned about what's happening in Myanmar. We are concerned that this might get imported into Thailand, actually. If you ask me what's our concerns. And, and I, personally, I feel that we have failed to engage properly with Myanmar as a Buddhist, predominantly Buddhist nation. We have failed to, to be there to try to influence neighbors in Myanmar into you know, a more peaceful direction. And anyhow, just to be fair to the author of this book, actually, uh, he cited you know, on page 77, a uh, rather infamous monk, and actually I wrote a, 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 an article or two about him. This monk by the name of Maha Abhisha, okay, who, who is very active, okay. So you can find something on Facebook, actually, on, or on social media, rapidly against uh, Muslims, particularly those in the Deep South. And according to Kun Anur, the 30-year-old monk, um, you know, um, calls on his Facebook page, and I quote, quoting the monk, to burn a mask for every Buddhist monk killed in the south. And he went on to say that if Buddhism is attacked, then violence is justified on grounds of self-defense. You know, we don't have to talk about whether we are practicing the original or the real authentic Buddhism or not. You know, we all know, okay, at least the, one of the five precepts is what's supposed to be that thou shalt not kill, that we, we should refrain from killing. And yet, you know, say the Thai um, 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 Buddhism still have not moved on to the point where they would try to insist that perhaps alms giving to monks should be vegetarian, for example. We used to insist on citing the old tales that, well, you know, during the Buddha time, and we don't even know if that's true or not, you know, the Buddha thought it was too trouble to insist that he only take alms from, you know, you know, arms that are vegetarian food, okay? Today, I, I don't think it's a big hurdle to just offer arms with, you know, vegan food to monks, and yet, you know, Thais would still cite this old claim that, well, it's been like that, so we don't move on, we can offer, you know, chicken, you know, meat or whatever to, to monks. So there's a lot of aspect, and, and I really hope, you know, instead of asking why uh, we are not as rabid as in Myanmar, I think, I, 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 I feel that the Thai media as well have failed to really raise the question as to how Thailand as a self-proclaimed, you know, proclaimed predominantly Buddhist society have failed to properly engage with its neighbor. Of course, I understand that, you know, the Thai-Burmese relations has not always been good, but still, Yes, uh, I don't live in Bangkok. I'm, my name is Marco Ravella. I live in Belgium. I am a member of the European Parliament involved in the Southeast Asian delegation. And uh, I, I just come from Myanmar where we had uh, a mission to examine the, the issue of the Rohingyas first in, uh, in Bangladesh and after in Myanmar. And uh, I listened to some uh, responsible politicians. They are clearly a Buddhist majority. Uh, and some, some of them deny completely what happens and the violence uh, towards the, the Rohingya people. And my question is, uh, how to combine uh, nationalism and... Uh, and I, sorry, I just received your book, uh, Mr. Dubus, and uh, you have a chapter devoted to nationalism and Buddhism. How to combine the, the two, uh, two aspects, nationalism and Buddhism, because, uh, you know, I remember in, in Europe a famous speech of François Mitterrand more than 20 years ago, the European Parliament said that nationalism uh, is a synonym of war. Uh, and uh, very, I would be interested to, to know the, the definition or... Uh, it's, uh, uh, well, I think Kun Prawit would give a better answer than me, but, but, but uh, um, it's, it's really a, a thing which uh, emerged uh, 
uh, late in, in Thai history, maybe at the end of Ayutthaya, but the, the association, the conflation between, between Buddhism and, and race and ethnicity was not uh, uh, something existing really, really before. Um, it's the same with the language, uh, the conflation between the Thai language and the, the, the race was, was not something which was made uh, um, uh, before the, the 18th century. It's something which was done top down, uh, and, and that's where all this uh, idea of Thainess, Thainess, the, the sense of Thai identity, uh, w was sort of created, and, and it's still very much used by the government uh, now. So Thainess, of course, uh, according to the concept, Buddhism is part of Thainess, language is part of Thainess, uh, but but in my feeling, it's it's a, it's a creation from the authorities, and you can when you discuss with a, with the common people, they nobody speak about Thainess. They're not uh, they're not doing a difference. Uh, if you uh, whatever your religion, if you're interested in Buddhism, they they will be very open on all these things. But but it's really something. Uh, Imagine, it's like the imagined communities, it's created by the authorities with a political aim. And, and of course, we, uh, Rama Fai wanted to create the nation state, which, which was good, uh, but the problem is, uh, is that uh, they never went beyond uh, this step of the nation state. And once you have a nation state, which is important, we, we, we had one in France, we needed this. Uh, uh, at a certain time of history, but then you sort of have to relax and, and sort of decentralize. Uh, uh, for instance, the local language, the local writing, were disappeared because there was an imposition of uh, what we call the central Thai in all the region, but even uh, in the central plain of Thailand, uh, the writing used for the Buddhist text was not Thai, but it was a kind of Khmer that we call Kom. Uh, it was actually Pali, Pali written with uh, Khmer letters. And, and uh, uh, this, was, this has disappeared. Only scholars can read this language. The same in the north with uh, Lanna. So uh, these subcultures have been destroyed. And, and uh, after the nation state was established, there was not really a movement to, to, to sort of uh, uh, recognize this local culture. It is a problem in, in the Malay sauce. Uh, the feeling, from from what I've seen, the problem, the the, the Malay people in southern Thailand, they they feel like the the Thai civil servants, the, the Thai military, the Thai police. They are occupiers of their territories. The way they see them is like the way the the Achanis were seeing the Indonesian army before. They see them as, as an occupier trying to impose a, a certain uh, culture on them. And uh, uh, I think that's uh, yeah, it's, it's part of the problem. I, I'm not sure I answer the question, but... Uh, if I may add, and I, I don't know why the author is not citing his own book um, in answering to the question. Because on page um, 76, he cited King Rama VI or King Vajirabhut who was Oxford educated and played an instrumental role in instilling this notion, which is actually English in origin, the notion that, you know, uh, the Thais or people ought to be loyal to the king, the nation, the king and religion. And then, you know, Kunan had cited a lecture uh, given by the king, Rama VI or King Vajirabhut in 1914, um, talking about the superiority of Buddhism. And I quote the king as being quoted in this book. Um, open quotation, every religion is suitable to particular nations and races. Buddhism is suitable to the Siamese race and inseparable from our nation. In other words, Buddhism is for Thai people. Besides, no other countries in the world knows Buddhism better than Siam. And Buddhism is only secure in Siam, in of quotation. There is an element of nationalism in, in, in Thai Buddhism. We, for instance, uh, during the financial crisis in 97, uh, 
I went to see uh, uh, Prapayam Kalayano uh, on, on uh, also Luang Tamahabua. And the, that time the, there was a resentment against the International Monetary Fund because the IMF wanted to impose uh, some rules on Thailand about how to, to, to manage the economy. And, and Papayam Kalayano and, and Long Tamahabua was extremely uh, uh, negative and aggressive against the IMF. So there was this element of, of nationalism, uh, but, but it's much less than, than uh, in, in Burma. It's really much less. And I think it's also connected to, to, to the history, of course. The fact that Thailand uh, was never colonized is, is a very important element because the monks were never, they never mobilized themselves uh, as a kind of political player. It happened in Sri Lanka, it happened uh, in almost every, every country, but not, not in, in Thailand. They didn't mobilize themselves against a foreign, a foreign power. I just wanted to, to add a question. Uh, we speak a lot about uh, relation between religion and nation. And what about uh, in, uh, the association, of, uh, International Association of Buddhism? What is uh, their role, or the what do the the, the Buddhist uh, in Southeast Asia are discussing about this question about uh, this relation between Buddhism and politics and Buddhism and nation? I, I, I'm curious about this uh, uh, international dimension of Buddhism. Uh. Well, uh, in, in a way, Tamakai, uh, what Pratamakai is the most international temple. They have uh, 83 temples overseas. Uh, yeah, 83 temples overseas. They are very connected to the Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese Buddhists. They are somehow uh, close to the, this uh, thing that we find in uh, South Korea. Foguan, Shan. Um, so they, they are very internationalistic in their outlook. And some people say their aim is to become the world center of, of Buddhism. If we put uh, what Pratamaka aside, um, there, there is not that many uh, uh, cooperation uh, among uh, uh, Thai Buddhist temples. I mean, they're going to India, they're doing uh, uh, trips to India. But for instance, the interreligious dialogue. Uh, it's not active at all in in uh, in Thailand. It's it's uh, it exists, but it, it's it's not very active. So um, I think they're sort of quite uh, nationally focused. But but again, what Pratamakai is um, try to change this, and, and they so they are accused of being uh, Mahayana uh, Buddhist because the way in, in the Theravada, Theravada tradition, it's more. Uh, one master monk with a, a few followers. But when you go to Wat Pratamaka, sometimes you have hundreds of thousands of, of people, and on, on, on it's something very strange. In Thailand, you, you don't see this anywhere. And so the way they, this kind of mass Buddhism, uh, it, it, it resembles, it, it's more like what we can see in countries uh, uh, like, like Korea. Uh, I, I mean, Um, yes, there is, there is a, a kind of evangelic uh, feel to, to it, and, and they, they using uh, the techniques they are using to market uh, the Tamakai Buddhism is, is the same technique that uh, the Protestant, some Protestant uh, groups who, would market Protestantism. I mean, they, they're using multi-level marketing. I'd like to thank the Belgian delegate, um, Mr. Delegate, just now for mentioning the Rohingyas, because I don't think you can talk about the um, extreme Buddhism in Burma without talking about the Rohingyas. And I'd like to point out that I would hesitate to characterize the monks here as tolerant, more of selectively tolerant, because I think most of us here are aware that, the, that um, attitudes towards the Muslim Rohingya here is actually very, very negative because apparently the Thai media characterized them as, uh, what do you call it? Um, characterized them as ungrateful little bastards, even after we offered them help. So I think if you were really concerned, if you were really um, sincere in your, 
in your um, wishes to limit the extremism in, in, in Burma and prevent it from coming to Thailand, you would also address those um, negative opinion we have of the Rohingya Muslims. Um, secondly, and this is my actual question, um, so uh, I think we are familiar with how um, political people tend to put themselves in a the morally superior uh, position. If you see in America, you have people going like, oh, he's, um, he's a good Christian man and therefore he's uh, suitable to lead our state, things like that. Or I hesitate to say this, but I think it's a more apt example how the political parties in Thailand itself often use the king as a way to say that they are fighting for the king and therefore they are right. So I'd like to ask, is this, um, how effective is, how influential is Buddhism in terms of presenting oneself politically? Because as um, Mr. Pravit said just, Pravit said just now, um, Buddhism now is kind of um, less because people get negative opinions from monks having Louis Vuitton bags or from monks doing unmonkly things. So generally, <laughs> gen generally, is, is doing, doing Buddhist things or Buddhist favorable things uh, an effective way to um, put yourself ahead of other people who are vying for the same political um, position? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think it's not a, a, a big part of the political platform of political parties, but of course they, they do participate as much as they can to the religious ceremonies and, and they're cautious uh, uh, not, to, not to criticize too much uh, the monastic uh, community. Um, if we look at the problem of the, 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 the financial scandals that we can see now in, in the Thai monastic community, uh, so there is an investigation going on, some money has been embezzled. And I'm not speaking about what Katamakai, but about uh, the recent case of about 12 temples who, who took some money with the complicity of a uh, civil, civil servant. Um, the government is very cautious on this because, because uh, the, the monastic communities had 300,000 monks. And, and they, they, they're quite, quite influential. So uh, you you cannot confront them. Uh, you have to be to be very careful. So they, there is a tendency. And uh, the Prime Minister Prayut, uh, as um, it was mentioned, he, he dissolved the, the Buddhist Reform Committee of the National Reconciliation uh, Council uh, when when he, there was a lot of uh, bad feeling with uh, the chairman of the committee. I would need it a one. Um, I, I don't know if I answer the question. If I may just add on the, the, the Thai press, I, I think they are, and I'm not counting myself as one of them now, they are probably guilty as charged, and I would advise that you name and shame them. You know, on social media, you can really be very specific if you see any instance where you know they try to portray the Rohingya as people in a, a very negative and unfair light. Okay? And, and just back to this issue of you know, the Muslims and Thai, you know, in Thailand, how they integrate and all that. You know? but one of the things that was never an issue, and it just dawned to me, was that uh, you know, the previous coup leader, not for you, but uh, General Sonti uh, Bunyakarin, was a Muslim. It was never really an issue that, wow, how can we have a Muslim uh, but, but actually, uh, leader? I remember at that time, um, mm -hmm. the protests in media, some protests in media in Thai, they were uh, attacking. Yeah, but it never, uh, it, it never became an issue beyond that. But it never that, became an okay? issue. So, which means the rest don't buy it, you know. Of course, we, yeah. we, we're bound to have extremists uh, here yeah, and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that it never gained any traction at all. Yeah, it was never an issue. Hello, my name is uh, Madeleine Apouge. I work for the Thailand Institute of Justice and I used to be an intern at the IRASEC. <laughs> so thank you so much for organizing this event. Um, I have not read the book yet, but I have two questions. Um, one, you said that um, Buddhism in Thailand may have failed to modernize itself. And I'm wondering what could mean this moderni modernization. So, for instance, 
Um, I see that um, there are a few Thai women who would like uh, to be recognized as female monks in Thailand and that they had to go to Sri Lanka uh, to be ordained since uh, the tradition of ordaining uh, women monks in Thailand was lost in history. Um, and I see also that in Cambodia, monks can vote. So I was wondering if these two aspects have ever been into uh, the questions and answers that you had during your interviews, that's one. And second, I read somewhere that in January 2017, the Senga Act was changed so that uh, the new king of uh, Thailand could uh, name the chief patriarch of the Buddhists in Thailand. And I'm really wondering what kind of consequences it can have on all these concepts of nation, uh, on, the co on the monastic community, etc. So, thank you very much. So, I'll start by the second question. Um, yeah, when there was this amendment, it was, uh, in a way, it was presented, the, the amendment was done because of a controversy. It was actually about what Pratamaka, because the, the monk who <coughs> should have become the Supreme Patriarch uh, some that uh, some that Chuang was very close to what Pratamakai and, and uh, uh, there was a lot of resistance uh, for him to become uh, supreme patriarch. So uh, the device used to avoid that he became supreme patriarch was to change the law, and it was presented as a as a return to the traditional power of the king, uh, who in the past before 1932 was appointing the, the supreme the Supreme Patriarch. So this, I, I speak a lot about this uh, in the book. The first question about modernization, so the question is how to modernize uh, Buddhism or why to modernize uh, Buddhism, right? Yeah, I, I was just wondering if the question of women as monks oh, okay, okay. Or, or monks being able to vote could be, for example, for example, part of this picture of modernization. What do you mean by modernizing Buddhism yeah, in Thailand? Modern. Well, the, the way Buddhism is uh, is in in the province, for instance. Uh, when I go to the temple in in, in the province, uh, sometimes there are not that many people. You know the this old temple with uh, dogs going around, and uh, uh, it's not really uh, a reflection of what is Thailand today. So, I, uh, for instance, the education level of monks in the province is not not very high. So uh, uh, now the Thai population, the, the education is, is much higher. So they, they want to, I think, to have uh, uh, to be able to speak with monks who, who are somehow at the same level as them. Uh, th that was one thing Tamakai has done for a very long time. All the monks in uh, Tamakai are graduated, at least with a bachelor degree, most of the time with a master degree. This was something very new uh, in, in Thailand because it started like 25 years ago. For the female monk, uh, uh, I personally think that they can bring a lot to Thai Buddhism because they're extremely committed, they bring a different perspective. Uh, I think that there is a, a kind of a doctrinal problem is that the, the lineage has been broken and in Theravada Buddhism, if the lineage is broken, uh, that's it, you, you can't, you, you can't uh, continue. Uh, so there are some very uh, um, technical points on this, but some scholars told me that the problem was the lineage is broken. So the monk are ordaining monk who are ordaining monk. And if this is broken, you, you can't just have a bikuni uh, coming out from, from nowhere. And, okay, they are ordained in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, here, I don't really know, but, but the fact that the, the Thai monastic community is very machistic, there is no doubt about it. And I personally think that a female monks bikuni uh, can be a, a factor of modernization and improvement. Uh, for sure, because they're just very, very committed to religion. Good, uh, good night. Gaspar Canela from the Spanish News Agency. If I'm not wrong, when, as uh, she said, uh, Buddhist monks cannot vote in Thailand. You ever had an election? 
but uh, I would like to ask, uh, according to the Vinaya and to the uh, legal law, uh, how much can monks be involved in politics? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on Vinaya, but I, I don't think you have very specific rules in, in the Vinaya uh, uh, about this, but, but uh, I mean, there is a kind of ambivalence. Uh, you, okay, you have the Lokia, the, 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 the common wall, and you have the Lokutara, the supramundane, supramundane wall. So you, in a way, you have two, two views of Buddhism. One view is that uh, uh, Buddhism and the monastic community is something isolated from the real world, and they are sort of observing and advising the, the real world, or observing the real world. And, and this is a very idealistic uh, image. And then you have the other view that, uh, uh, in a way, it's engaged Buddhism that the monastic community should be engaged in the world. They should help to manage the world. There is a kind of uh, responsibility for them uh, to uh, engage in the world. And if you look at the Buddha himself, so the Buddha was from a, a princely family. Uh, he was the son of a prince. He, he, he left the palace, but then he, he, he was very much in relation with uh, local kings in India, advising them and, and with very rich people. So he was involved in, in these things too. So the, I think the, the view of Buddhism as a kind of superbly isolated uh, entity cut from the world is not, uh, it's not very, very realistic. Uh, uh, Buddhism is about morality, and, and morality is important uh, uh, to, to rule the world. And when uh, I was sometimes discussing with military and, and Thai police about this issue of Buddhism and politics, and for them they say it's completely separated, and, but it's, uh, I mean, everything is politics, you know. Buddhism is an institution, monastic community is an institution, uh, they are under the education ministry, uh, they play a role of legitimation of political power, so they have a political role. It's, it's, uh, uh, in reality, they have a political role. Of course, in the language world, we can say that it's not true, but in reality, they are deeply involved in politics. It cannot be uh, uh, different. If I may just add, um, actually, I think ordinary Thais, when they think of Buddhism, they think of it as a religion that's totally detached from politics. And that's why the issues of you know, the monks having the rights or no rights world was really never an issue. There's a consensus that that's, that's not for the monks. You know, they're supposed to be not involved in the worldly affairs. And yet, you know, a book as this, and I'm still trying to promote your book, <laughs> uh, dwell on the very fact uh, and, and illustrate how deeply intertwined is this state-sanctioned Buddhism and, and politics and society. There is a little bit two, two different elements. There is a, a monastic community as an institution under the state. So this is a case. And because they are under the state, it's already political. And then you have individual monks like Praputa Isara or before Prakiti Vuto who are involved in day-to-day -day politics, politic politician as we would say in France. So this is a slightly different. And this is usually not really accepted uh, by Thai people. I mean, uh, Prabhupada Isara, uh, you know, leading uh, his troops to, uh, to go to this building, to block elections and so on. Uh, I, I think most Thai people must think, uh, oh, this is, this is wrong. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not really good. So there are two, two elements. If I may just try to be a devil's advocate. You know, in Sri Lanka, monks, uh, you know, get directly and openly engage in politics. And I think maybe we should also ask if we ought to allow or, you know, change the norm and say, you know, monks can get involved in politics, even vote and e perhaps even run for parliament. Um, and whether that would make 
you know, the state-sanctioned Buddhism uh, 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 better and more up-to-date with the reality because anyhow they're doing it behind the scene or in a, a, a more, more, you know, uh, implicit way. So, um, it's, uh, the time is fine, so uh, last question please and then uh, we will, uh, and you can still uh, discuss uh, after the end of the conference. So, there is uh, uh, on, on the, oh, there is three, but is there a, a, a the end? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my name is Pat Turnham. I'm a PhD student at the Faculty of Political Science from Oregon University. Um, so, although I have one question that, um, after all, after I read some of your books, uh, because I just got your book shortly before, before the images happened, um, the questions that have raised to my mind is that is all these things that we have seen in, in Thailand uh, regarding the relationship with, with Buddhism and politics is, is a failure of what we call as the secularizations here in Thailand or anywhere else in the world? Sorry, I didn't get fully the question. Is um, the question is that, uh, is this current phenomenon reflects the failure or the, uh, you know, just like a immaterialize of the projects, we call it as a secularization that happens in Europe, you know, separation between the state and the religion. I see. Um, yeah, I, as I was saying before, I think a lot of the problems are actually coming from this close association uh, between between the church and, and the state. And But but of course it's so much ingrained, because in, in France we had this problem too, uh, and, and, uh, it was separated uh, when exactly, uh, I suppose, under, under G. Ferry, uh, 1905. 1905, yes. Uh, um, but we, we have the, the, the same problem, but, but in, in Thailand it's so ingrained because uh, it was born with the nation state, so so the monastic community is, is really part of the process. So it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to to, to envisage it, it, it's not a, se a, separa a quick separation. I mean, this will take a, a lot of time. Monks like Prapesa and Visalo, they are advocating this, but but to go there, it, it will take a it will take a long time because it's it's not an easy process. And, uh, and as I say, the the monk at the top of the hierarchy uh, uh, are not willing to do it. Also, for example, Prapayut Payuto now is. Is a member of the Supreme Sangha Council. Um, I'm not sure what has, uh, his idea on this, but th there could be some evolution, but it would be very slow. If I may just add, uh, I, I think uh, it's very important, and I, the way I see it is that Thai, in Thailand, in Thai society, we have yet to be able to really secularize Buddhism or deconstruct Buddhism, and that prevents us from really having a very independent, uh, rational views towards society and religion, and like in Europe. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, your very fascinating questions. And thank you, Parit and Arnaud, for your uh, very interesting comment uh, on these uh, important issues. So uh, we can still discuss after the conference. Uh, so um, thank you. Thank you.